all right. So we're talking about uh, decoding RM codes. Okay. So in this context, it turns out we were uh, we were looking at finite geometries, and uh, what I'm going to do in this class is to begin with a simple example and talk about how lines and planes and all these things look in a very simple example, so that you get a rough idea. Then after that, we'll uh, we'll try and uh, go into some more general things. Okay. So for example, I'm going to take basically it's going to be RM, no, not RM. Okay. So. Okay, so the example I'm going to take is uh, e.g. four comma two. Okay, so what is e.g. four comma two? The points of this Euclidean geometry are basically zero one four, right? And for some reason, this is not. Okay, so points are 0, 1, 4. So, how many of them are there? There are 16 points. Okay, uh, so just to visualize, maybe we'll, we'll write these points down like this. Okay, and maybe a little bit blur here. Okay, so those are the 16 points in this geometry. Okay, so you're, you're definitely used to the real geometry where you have an infinite number of points and you always deal with equations. Here there are just 16 points, so the thing is just pretty easy. Okay, so certain subsets of the points we are going to call them as lines and planes and all that. So one flat, two flat, three flats. Okay, so dimension is four, right? So you'll have one flat which will be the line, and then two flats which you can think of as a plane, and three flat which is called the hyperplane. Because it's one less than the dimension and then because everything together is the last thing. Okay. So one point which is the all zero is called the origin. So just like the floor. Okay. And it's easiest to think of these flats that go through the origin. Okay. So because any flat that goes through the origin will be a subspace of 0, 1 m. Okay, 0, 1, 4. It will be a proper subspace. So once it's a subspace, you know subspaces are defined by bases or the dual basis, right? So either the basis itself or the set of orthogonal things describe the subspace. So it's very nice. Okay. So usually you start with lines and planes and all that that pass through the origin. Okay. So so how do we define a line? Okay, so I want one of the points to be the origin. So usually if a line passes through the origin, what is its equation in the 2D plane or not? It's some y equals mx, right? So you have some constant m and then you multiply with x. Okay. So if I if I say the line passes through the origin, right? So what you need is actually just one more point on the line, any other point. Okay, so you have the origin. And then if I give you any other point, say x1, y1. Okay, so let me do it, do it that way. Okay, so if I give you the origin and then I give you some other point, x1, y1, what do you do to get the line? You basically take this vector and then multiply that vector by all possible scalars. So that will give you all the the entire line, right? So that's what you do. Okay. So there is a similar argument here. Okay. So I give the origin. If I give you any other point, say for instance this point, what should I do to get the line passing through the origin and that point? I have to take that point and multiply by all possible scalars. But for me, in the binary case, the scalars are only zero and one. So if I multiply by zero, I get zero. Multiply by one, I get that point itself. Okay. So as it turns out, the origin and any other point will form a line. Okay. So how many such lines will we have that pass through the origin? 15 lines will have passing through the origin. Okay. So now how do you get lines? So, so is that clear? So, so for instance lines to the origin are something like 0, 0, 0, 0 and then 0, 1, 1, 0. Then we have other lines 
These are the lines that pass through the origin. So how do you get a line that does not pass through the origin? Okay, so if you have a line that does not pass through the origin, you can always shift it by some constant, translate it, so that it passes through the origin. Okay, so same principle you can use here also. So you take a line through the origin and then add something to it. Add a constant uh, number to it, vector to it. You will get some other line that passes through some other two points. Okay, so here what do you do? If I want a line, say, uh, so if you want any other line, so I would take this guy and say add something, say 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. If I take this line and then add 0, 0, 0, 1, I'll get another line. It will be 0, 0, 0, 1 and then 0, 1, 1, 1. Okay, so that will be another line. Okay, so if you think of this as a line, this guy is another line. Okay. Right? So that's the, that's the idea. Okay. So, so, so lines can be described that way. Okay, so lines are described by two points that pass through them. Right. So in the in the you, in the binary case, when this guy is two, the scalars are really only two. So you'll have only two points in the line. You can't have anything more than two. Okay, so there'll be only two points in every line. Okay. So so another thing that we'll often use is this notion of an incidence vector. Okay. So what is an incidence vector? So I have 16 points, okay. So what I can do is I can think of, sorry. So I have 16 points. I can think of putting these 16 points in a row, okay. So I'll put 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, all the way to 1, 1, 1, 1, all of them in a row, okay. And then if I have a subset, okay, if I have a subset of these points, okay, the points are here. Okay. If I have a subset of these points, so the subset is the line, okay, so maybe it's the line, okay, 0, 0, 0, 0, and then 0, 1, 1, 0. I can define an incidence vector for this subset. What is an incidence vector for the subset? If a particular point belongs to the subset, for that entry you put 1. If it doesn't belong, you put 0. Okay, so likewise there will be this 0, 1, 1, 0 somewhere, but the line will be 1, everything else will be Okay. So, what will be the length of the incidence vector? It will be 16. Okay. okay. So, anytime you have a basic set and then you have a bunch of subsets of all these sets, okay, of this set and you have a lot of subsets, you can always think of incidence vectors. Okay. So, it is a very commonly used uh, technique in combinatorics and all this. People use incidence vectors to do a lot of counting. Okay. So, we can do that also here. So, so, so one nice thing with respect to reed solomon codes is the incidence vectors are vectors which look like they could be code words, right, in a way. They are length 2 par m, length 16, they are the right length and they are binary 0 or 1. So incidence vectors of these subsets are, they belong in the proper space at least, okay. We will show eventually that incidence vectors of these 1 flats and 2 flats belong to reed solomon codes. We will do that, but for now we suggest vectors in of length 2 par m, okay, so in general or here in this case vectors of length 16. Is that okay? So eventually these incidence vectors will are the bridge between this finite geometry and read read Miller curves. Okay, so through these incidence vectors we go from geometry to read Miller curves. Okay, so that is lines. If I want planes, what should I do? Okay, so a plane is basically a two dimensional subspace. Okay, so you have a two dimensional subspace of these 16 points, you need two basis vectors. Okay, so maybe I take these two as some basis vectors. This guy, and maybe this guy. Okay. It turns out once you have I mean any subspace will definitely have zero also in it, right? What will be the what will be another one? See I am defining a two dimensional subspace with these two as the basis vectors. So what are the vectors in the subspace? Yeah, so it's the sum of those two, right? So it's going to be just 0, 0, 0, 1, which is this guy. Okay, so those four guys form a plane which passes through the origin. Okay, so it's a two flat that goes through the origin. It's also a two dimensional subspace. So it's nice. So if, if maybe maybe you wanted to find some other plane that way. So all you have to come up with is two different points in this, take that as the basis of your plane, and then form the linear combinations. 
you will get the plane. So, how many points will there be in a plane? In a two flat, you will have four. Okay, so likewise, in a three flat, you will have eight. Okay, so of course, beyond three flat, it's not really interesting in uh, in the four-dimensional thing, right? So, four flat is entire thing, and after that, you won't get anything else. Okay, so okay, so for two flat, there are four points. One easy thing is to take the basis and then form the four vectors which are there in the two flat. It turns out you can also have planes that don't pass through the origin. How do you think of those planes? In the in R3, for instance, you can have a plane that does not pass through the origin. You can always translate it to make it pass through the origin. So in reverse, you can start with a plane that is in the through the origin and then add something to it. Same thing you can do here. So you can take this plane and say add 1010 one, zero, one, zero, go. Okay, so I need another shape here, so I'll use the shape. Okay. I'll add 1010 one, to each point of that plane. So what will I get? I get 1011. One, one. And then I get 0010. Zero, zero, and then zero, zero, one, one, right? So that's it. So you can see why, I mean, even in terms of there is a translation effect going on. I mean, this is the way I wrote down the points. Okay, you can write down the points in any other way you like. But you can see it kind of makes sense to call, call these things as planes and all that. It's not a hard point. So that would be another plane which does not pass through the origin. It's translated away from the origin. Okay, so it's not a subspace, but still it will have four points. All right. So that's the that's the idea. Okay. So you can have, for instance, uh, incidence vector for the for a two flat. Okay, we have an incidence vector for the two flat. How many ones will it have? For instance, if we take the squiggly, squiggly ellipse uh, incidence vector, this is going to be one. This is going to be one, and then you'll have a one at one zero zero zero, and then you'll have a one at one zero zero one. How about that? Everything else will be. Okay, so that will be the incidence vector for the two flat. Okay, already one nice thing you're observing is if I have an m minus r flat. What will be the weight of the incidence vector? 2 power m minus r. Okay. So it's all the weights are powers of 2, and that's something which is very nice for Reed Muller code because we know powers of 2 is what really happens and occurs in the Reed Muller code definition. Okay. So all those things are nice connections which you can think about. Okay. Alright. Okay. So this is the this is kind of something that was I was alluding to towards the end of last class how it works and all that. Okay. So some interesting questions that will turn out. That, that will be very important in uh, finite geometry at least is given a geometry like this how many lines are there okay, so let me see take some time think about it and answer this question in this 16.014 how many lines are there okay. is that the correct answer 16.3c2 Is that okay? Will you not be? Sixteen chief shoes 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 correct. Everybody is happy with that. Okay. Does it make sense? No. Maybe yes. Okay. So so. So there are various ways to do this counting. One easy method that I like is to do the do the incidence vector kind of thing. So what you can do is uh, you can you can make a you can make a big big matrix. Okay, you can make a big big matrix. You put the points here. So how many columns will there be? Sixteen points, and then you put lines here, and you fill it up with incidence vectors for the lines. Okay, so so maybe you have capital L lines. Okay, how many ones will there be in each line? Two. So there will be two ones. Okay. So wait a two. How many ones will there be in each column? Fifteen. Is that okay? Everybody is happy. Is that correct? Fifteen. The correct answer. Okay. So let's say fifteen. Okay. So if you say fifteen ones. So two ones in each row, and then fifteen ones in each column. So now this gives you a formula for L, does it not? You count the total number of ones in the matrix, column wise and row wise. 
Okay, so you count it column wise, you have 16 times 15, and that has to be equal to L times 2 and 2 and right. Okay, so L equals 16 choose 2. Okay, so you might wonder for lines, it is really quite simple, I don't have to do it. For planes and all, it can be a little bit more tricky. Okay, so it's not that difficult, but you can count the total number of planes. Okay, and then you might want to count things like uh, if I have a line, how many planes contain that line? Okay. Right. So, so let's say this is the number of lines. What about the number of number of two flaps? Number of two flaps is what? Fifteen C two, not sixteen C two. So you can take any two, but one of them cannot be sixteen C three. Why did it go to C3 now? Don't you get repetitions? Okay, so let us do this once again. Okay, so I am just doing this for fun, it is not really that useful. So let us let us say how many two flats are there in this? Okay, so how do you go about doing that? How many two flats are there? See, lines were easy, any two points between any two points there was a line. But how do you think of how do you think of uh, two flats? Right? How do you how do you do that? Okay, what is the test here? <laughs> so, you have to be careful about over counting, okay. So, because you can count planes in multiple ways. See, for instance, if I take this squiggly plane, I could have taken the basis to be these two or these two or these two, okay. Any which way I take the basis, I will get the same plane, okay. So, I cannot just count 15 choose 2, there I am over counting, right. If I say 15 choose 2, it gives you all possible choices, right. So, it will be slightly careful there. And then you have to divide by something. What should you divide by? So, let us say number of two flats through the origin. Give me the number of two flats through the origin. How will you add that? Yeah, you have to divide by 3, right. Is it clear? So, you have to take 15 choose 2 and then you have to divide by 3. Why do you have to divide by 3? Because every plane has three different bases. Okay, and you are counting all the possible bases there. So, you have to divide by 3. You are over counted by 3. Okay. So, that will be the number of two flats that pass through the origin. Okay. So, likewise, you can do. So, if, if number of two flats passing through the origin is 15 choose 2 by 3, what is the number of two flats passing through any other point? So, again the same thing. Okay. So, once you answer that question, you put this matrix. You put this matrix, you will get your answer. Right. Each plane has 4 points. There are 16 points. And how many planes are there through each point? 15 choose 2 by 3. So, number of planes times, times 4 should be equal to 15 choose 2 by 3 times 16. And you solve that and you get the number of planes. Okay, so, you can put the matrix like this. So, critical question to answer is how many flats, how many 2 flats or 3 flats or whatever pass through a particular point. That you can do by this simple counting argument. Once you do it, you can again answer the question of total number of planes, total number of two flats, three flats, etc. So, it is careful counting. You have to be wary of over counting itself. The only thing you have to be careful about is over counting. Okay. Is it okay? So, these things are not too critical. Maybe there will be some assignment questions on this, but it is quite easy to do this calculation. Okay. Is it okay? That is fine. So, we can maybe check that. So, number of two flats through the origin. Number of two flats. 2, 0, 0, 0, 0, it is going to be equal to, like you said, 15 to 2 was correct, but then you will be over counting by 3, so that is 7 times 5, 35, ok, so it says answer is 35, so I do not know, I hope this method is correct, ok, so there are 35 planes that pass through every single point, ok, so number of 2 flats, what is the number of 2 flats times 4 should be equal to 16 times 35, so that gives you the number of two flats to be 140. Okay, that will be the total number of two flats that pass through the that, that are in this geometry. Okay, so like I said, these are all finite geometry. Subject will be finite. You can't have anything infinite. Okay, so number of planes in R2 is no number of lines in R2. There's no need to ask that question. Your answer is infinite. You know immediately what it is. Here it's not like that. Okay, so you'll have a finite number, and you have to play around with the combinatorics to correctly count. So, it is not too hard, but you have to do it carefully. How did I get this 3 again? 
3 comes from the question, answer to the question, how many different bases are there in a 2 flat? In one 2 dimensional subspace that passes through the origin, how many different bases are there? That answer is 3. Okay? That number can be calculated. It is a little bit more tricky as you go larger and larger, but it can be calculated. Is it okay? Think about it. But for the binary case, it is very easy. For the non binary cases, it becomes a little bit more tricky, but it can be done again. All right, so that is done. Another question I want to ask is, suppose I fix a line, let us say a line through the origin. Okay, so I fix a line through the origin. How many planes will contain that line? That is my next question. Fourteen, right? Does it seem like a simple enough answer? Fourteen? Thirteen? What is the correct answer? And then if these two are fixed, then uh, one more point is fixed, because that is above the Some of these two is that itself. A fixing line, there is nothing more you get. So you take any other point. So suppose I fix this line 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. I have the liberty to pick one other point. So that gives me one more. So I can pick that plane in two different ways. I could have picked this point or that point. So it is going to be 14 by 2, so 7. 7 would be the correct answer. Well, okay, so you took these two, you pick one point, say you pick 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, that tells you that 1, 0, 0, 0 is also there. So you can't say all 14 will give me different planes. Two of the points will give you the same plane. So you divide by 2, you get 7. Okay, so these are simple calculations, but you know, if you are doing it for the first time, you will be careful about the overcounting. Always watch out for the overcounting. Okay, so it is a simple question of dividing, but still you have to watch out for the overcounting. Okay, so the number of planes that pass through a fixed line is 7. Okay, so something like that. So those are those are answers that you can do. So my point is, the main point I want to make is, in any finite geometry like this, all these questions have like exact answers. Questions like how many planes, how many lines are contained in a plane, how many planes pass through a given line, how many uh, planes pass through a point, how many three flats pass through a point, how many three flats are contained in, uh, how many two flats are contained in three flats. All these questions have fixed definite answers. Okay, so you can think about them, do the computation, you'll get the answer. Okay, so that's the point I wanted to make. Last class, I don't know if it was very clear to you, but this is the way you count. It's not very hard. Okay, so now next comes the main result, which I kind of informally stated for you. The main result, which links these two things, is incidence vector of m minus r flats. In e g m comma two uh, are code words of R M R. So I not have been so precise last time because I probably didn't uh, mention this incidence vectors and all that. This is the precise. So you take an m minus R flat in e g m comma two. Okay. R is the same R, okay? It is not some other arbitrary thing. Take an M minus R flat in EGF M comma 2 and then take its incidence vector. So its incidence vector will have weight 2 power M minus R, right? So M minus R flat is going to have minus R basis vector. So you pick uh, 2 power M minus R uh, different points there. So, so that will have weight 2, min, 2 power M minus R. So in fact, if they normally code works, they are minimum weight code works. What are the minimum weight code works? Easy to see, right? They have 2 per m minus r. 2 per m minus r is the minimum distance of r m r comma m. Okay, so the incidence vectors of m minus r flats are the minimum weight code words of the Reed Muller code r comma m. Okay, so that is the connection, and uh, this gives you an easy way of coming up with the minimum weight code words of the Reed Muller code. Okay, and uh, like I said, the duals of Reed Muller codes are also Reed Muller codes. So if you want to come up with parity checks for decoding, you only have to come up with incidence vectors of some flats, right, because ultimately if you are interested in orthogonal checks, you are going to be interested in lower weight guys, right, you do not want very high weight uh, vectors, right, because then orthogonality is going to be difficult, you want lower weight guys, right, and uh, minimum weight vectors of reed muller codes are simply incidence vectors of flats and dual of a reed muller code is again some other reed muller code. So you only have to come up with incidence vectors of r flats to think about Majority logic decoding. That's the idea.
example okay okay so 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 let me prove this to you this is not not very hard and very easy to prove okay so if you have an m minus r flag okay so far i've been talking about the basis vectors m minus r basis vectors completely fixed it an equivalent uh, picture is the dual space okay so an m minus r flag once you go to the dual space it's defined by r equations R equations of the form summation A i j B j plus B i uh, B i equal to zero. So we will go from one to n. A i j i is from one to r. A i j is zero or one. Not all zero. I mean, of course, I mean, not all zero is not the really big thing. It has to be like linearly independent and all that. So this, this, this defines an. I said this, this, this defines an M minus R flag. So it cannot be dependent and all that. So it will be top of. Then B I also is zero one. Okay. So any M minus R flag is defined by R equations. And remember, the degree of each equation is what? One. Okay. So now. I want to show this. Well, this belongs to Riemann code R comma M. Okay, so what does Riemann code R comma M have? It contains evaluations of of what? Evaluations of polynomials of degree less than or equal to R. Okay, right? so this is like a polynomial of degree one. Okay, but my points are those which evaluate to which which evaluate to zero. Then I plug in here. Okay, so I have to move from zero to one, right? This, these points that satisfy that fall on the M minus R flag have to evaluate to one when I plug it in. Is it okay? Only then I'll get my proper code work. Is it okay? Do you understand what I'm saying here? Okay, so maybe I should write it down. Okay, so suppose I want to make an incidence vector for the R M minus R flag. What will be the incidence vector? So I have my points. All zero, all the way to all ones. Okay, what do I do? I take each of this v1, vm. I plug it into the R equations. If all of them evaluate to zero, then I know I should put a one here. Okay, but I have to move from this world into a polynomial evaluation world. How does the polynomial evaluation world work? I have a polynomial f of v1 to vm. It's a Boolean polynomial. I simply plug in the v1 to vm here. And I put that value there. Okay. If I want the incidence vector of this guy to belong to the Riemann code, I should come up with the f of degree less than or equal to r, which will evaluate to one whenever a point is in the m minus r flag. It should evaluate to zero otherwise. So the whole trick is to come up with that construction. How do you come up with an f of v1 to vm, which has degree r or less than or equal to r, and then it should evaluate to one whenever I plug in a point of the two flag m minus r flag. It should evaluate to zero otherwise. Is it okay? Okay. That trick is it's quite simple. It's not a very difficult trick. All you have to do is this. Okay. You take this, and then you make a product of i equals one to r of these guys. Summation a i j b j plus b i. But then you add a one to it. Okay. Don't just do it that way. You add a one to it. Okay. And then you this j only goes from one to n. So that's the trick. Okay. Now I have a polynomial of degree what equal to r. Okay. Right? So evaluation of this polynomial at all the points will definitely belong to the Riemann code R M of R comma n. What is so nice about this construction is for every point in the M minus R flag, what will happen to this expression for every i? It will be zero. So that will be one. Overall, the polynomial will evaluate to one, and we'll get a one. For every point which is not in the m minus r flag, what will happen? For at least one equation, this will evaluate to one, and that will make the entire polynomial zero, and we'll get this zero. Okay. So the evaluation of f is the same as the incidence vector, and it has to be r, which means the incidence vector belongs to the Riemann code r command. So it's a very simple proof. It's not really that fancy, but. 
it's a nice little construction. This trick is quite, quite interesting. How do you go from uh, some equations that are equal to zero to a polynomial whose evaluation is something that can be controlled? It is a not very difficult trick, but it's an important, important trick to get this answer. Is that okay? All right. So if you have, so 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 there are few other things that you should keep in mind now. Okay. So you have a lot of uh, inclusions there which you should be mindful of. See, read Miller code of R comma M is contained in what? Read Miller code of R plus one comma M. Right? It's fully contained in read Miller code of R plus one comma M. So if you have M minus R flats belonging to R M of R comma M, they will also belong to incidence vectors of M minus R flats will also belong to R M of R, R plus one comma M. Okay. So once you fix M minus R r r plus 1 all the way to n the incidence vectors will still belong that's because of this inclusion is it okay all right so that's the first uh, point another way to think about it is what about m minus r minus 1 flats if i have an incidence vector of m minus r minus 1 flat that will be in r m of r comma m is that okay? Is that correct? Or did I make a mistake there? Yeah, that's okay. All right. M minus R minus one into brackets. Yes, it's M minus R plus one. It goes larger. It will go to a larger weight. You know, go to a lower weight. Okay. So if you have M minus R plus one flat, that will also belong to this thing. Okay. Is it okay? So so let me write that down very carefully. Maybe with an example. Okay. So let's take an example. Let's take uh, this 4 comma 2, so let's take Rm of 2 comma 4. Okay, so this will contain incidence vectors of because of what? So, first of all, okay, so incidence vectors of uh, m minus r, right? So, two flats in. Uh, E.g. 4 comma 2. Is that okay? What else will it have? It will also have incidence vector of 3 flats. It will also have incidence vector of 4 flats. The 4 flats are quite trivial. This is the entire all ones. All ones is there that we know. Is that okay? Is that clear? If you consider that you contain the incidence vector of 2 flats and 3 flats. So if you look at any other read Miller code, so let's say read Miller code of 3 comma 4. This will contain incidence vectors. I don't. I, I don't want to keep repeating with incidence vectors. When I say if it contains two flats, I mean it's clear that it has to be incidence vector. It will be one flat, two flats, and three flats. Okay. So that's how we have to think about it. So it will have all. These things. What about read Miller code of one comma four, three flats? Okay. So what is the dual? The dual of this day is this day, right? Am I right? So if I want to do majority logic decoding of Rm of 1 comma 4, okay, suppose that's what I want to do, and I have to look for orthogonal parity checks in, in the dual, right? I have to find the orthogonal parity checks for Rm of 1 comma 4, which will be code words of Rm of 2 comma 4. Okay. So what you do there, the strategy is as follows. Okay, so like I said, there was the main result, right? What is the main result that I stated? Rm of R comma M can be decoded by R plus one step uh, majority logic decoding, right? Right, that was the uh, uh, distance up to how many the half of two power m minus r minus one minus. Okay, okay. What does that mean? So when I say r plus one step majority logic decoding, remember these steps, right? For the Hamming code, I illustrated that, right? So you take the uh, 
uh, first you find orthogonal checks on a subset of the error vectors, not just E0, but say E0 plus E1, E0 plus E2 like that. And then you recursively repeat it, repeat it, repeat it till you get to just E0 alone. Okay? And then you repeat the same process. Okay. So, so if I say half of 2 power m minus r minus 1 is up, up to that many errors can be corrected, how many orthogonal parity checks do I need in each step? So, what is my j? j has to be equal to 2 power m minus r minus 1. Okay, it has to be that. Right? Only then you will have uh, you will have this, this many this. Okay? So, so it turns out what you have to do in R of 2 comma 4 is to first, if I'm not wrong, uh, you have to start with two flats. Okay, right. So R of 1 comma 4 is two-step majority logic decodable. So you have to start with all the two flats. Okay, and then ask the question: Can I find? So, so okay, let me let me rephrase it. Okay, so you should start with trying to find orthogonal parity checks on a one flat. Okay. So that's the idea. So let me write that down. So here's an example of the left and back. So if you do Rm of 1 comma 4, two step ML is decodable. ML is majority logic. So let me write that down carefully. Let's say two step majority logic decodable. Okay, with J equals what? 7, right? What is this? Number 7 is coming. Okay, so we also answer the question 7. So what you do is, you start with some one flat. Okay, so, so let me say the dual is Rm of 2 comma 4 and it contains, contains what? 2 flats. Okay, so you start with any one flat. Okay, some one flat, say that passes through the origin. Okay, and then ask the question. Uh, then ask. Then what you do is, you collect all all two flats passing through this. So you start with the one flat, say that passes through the origin 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, something like that. And then you collect all the two flats that not passing through, I'm sorry, what did I say? That contain this one flat, sorry. I'm getting confused with this, but contain this specific one flat. The answer to that is what? How many two flats will there be? We just do that calculation, it's going to be 7. Okay. We take the incidence vectors of all these two flats. You know that they are that they are parity checks for my code. How do I know that? How do I know that they are parity checks for Rm one comma four? Well, that's the dual. Dual is Rm two comma four. All the two flats belong to Rm two comma four. The next thing is they'll all be orthogonal on this one flat. Okay. Think about that. It's, it's a relatively easy thing to think about. So you can go back and think about this geometry if you like. Okay. So if I take this line and then look at all the planes that contain that line, they will be orthogonal on that line. Okay? Because all of them will check that line, because all of them contain that line and no two of those planes can have anything in common. Okay? It cannot happen. Okay? Then it won't be a proper plane. Because if they have something in common, the other thing will also be the same. It cannot be different, right? Because this line is fixed. You have one other point, you have two other points in this plane. If there is some other plane which overlaps in one point, what will happen? What is the other point? Is it this plus that? That also has to be the same. Okay, so you cannot have two planes that pass through a line overlapping in anything else. Okay, think of this is true in uh, this is true in R three also. Okay, if you have two planes that have a line in common, they cannot have anything else in common. Because they are overlapping in that line, they cannot overlap anymore else. Otherwise, they will be on top of each other. Okay, think of R three. We have two planes that, that are intersecting in a line, okay, they cannot intersect anywhere else. Well, if they intersect anywhere else, then the two planes will be identical. Okay, the same proof we can use here and show that these will form orthogonal parity checks on the one flat. Is that okay? Is that fine? Reasonably clear? Okay. So, so you take, 
So this form on our programmer topic from a setup. On the one flag. Is it okay? Right? Hope, hope it's clear. It's not not uh, going too fast, but that's the that's the logic. Okay, so you start with one flag, collect all the two flags that contain this one flag. There are seven of them, so I can find seven parity checks that are orthogonal on the one flag. Okay, so so that's the first uh, step. So now what do I need? So that's the first step in my now what to logic decoder? Okay, now I can do two step. In the next step, what do you do? You just repeat this process for several one flags that pass through the origin. Okay, so say let's say this is one flag through origin. How many one flags are there through the origin? There are 15 of them. You just take any seven. Okay, so no point in going beyond seven. If you want, you can go beyond seven also. If you want the correct mode, then there are a correcting capability. You can go beyond seven. So you take all the flags that are through the origin. For each of those flags, you repeat the same exercise. Okay, so you take any other one flag. So that's the first step. The first step will contain one flag. How many such one flags do you need? You take seven such one flags. Okay, repeat for seven such seven or more. I say seven or more such one flags. Okay, one flags to the origin. Right. So all of these are one flags to the origin. What does that mean? These one flags to the origin can overlap only at zero. They cannot overlap anything else. So all these one flags to the origin form an orthogonal set for E zero for the origin itself. Okay. And then in, the, in the second step, we use those checks to decode the easy. Is it okay? Okay. So in the first step, we have found the 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 subset corresponding to the one flag we have found. Okay. Now we repeat that for every one flag that you have. Say you have seven of them. Okay, all of them are passing through the origin. Remember that. Okay, all of them are passing through the origin. So these one flags now form a orthogonal. Now I can't say parity check, but they form an orthogonal subset for E zero. Why can't I say it's a parity check? One flags are not an RM two comma four. They are not regular parity checks. We just we have found them in one step. That's all. Okay. Now in the second step. Use one flags to find E zero. Okay. All right. That is reasonably clear. Okay. So this is for the origin. What I did for the origin, I can do for any other point. Okay. It doesn't matter. Origin is just some one point. You just translate it. You can just keep repeating. That's the nice thing about geometry. Right? The origin is not fixed. You simply translate, repeat. So we do the suitable adjustments in your translation. Okay, so it's adjustments are a little bit more complicated. But nice thing about regional approaches is origin is some special thing. I don't really care about decoding the origin that much. Once I decode the first bit, E1, I'm done because it's cyclic, right? I can just simply cyclically shift it and repeat the same process. Okay, so I don't have to do it for every single point. I have to do it maybe for the origin, and then do it for one other point. Then do cyclic shifts after that in a suitable permutation. Okay, so maybe we'll uh, do this explicitly for the RM one comma four with, with one guy. Maybe you'll uh, like that a little bit. Okay, so let me just uh, capture this guy. Okay, so this thing is not going away. Okay, so this was our growth. Okay, so let's take the one flag. Zero 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 one. Okay, like I said, there are seven two flags that contain this one flag. Okay, so this uh, so so what are the two flags? So I'm going to write the equations directly. Okay, so it's simpler. Okay, so 
I'm looking for E0 plus E1 to always be in the parity set. What else will there be? So it's just a question of taking one more. So suppose I take 0, 0, 1, 0. What will be the fourth point? 0, 0, 1, 1. So one parity check is E3 equals 0. Then I have E0 plus E1. What else can I take? I cannot take 0, 0, 1, 1 again because it's already there. Right? So maybe I'll take 0, 1, 0, 0. So what will I get? 0, 1, 0, 1. So it will be E4 plus E5 equals 0. And what else? E4 plus E1 plus. I can't take E5 again. I'll take E6. It will be E6 plus E7 equals 0. And then, not 0. I'm sorry. What am I saying? Sorry. So this will all be uh, the, the syndromes, right? S1, S2, S3, so on. Okay, so how do I form this S1? R0 plus R1 plus R2 plus R2. Okay, so it goes here, okay? And then I'll do E0 plus E1 plus E8 plus E9 equals S4. And then you'll have E0 plus E1 plus E10 plus E11 equals S5. And then E0 plus E1 plus E12 plus E13 equals S6. And then the last one. E0 plus E1 plus E14 plus E15 equals S7. So these are all computed in an identical way. But then I have a set of 7 parity checks which are clearly orthogonal on E0 plus E1. Okay? And then I can also repeat the same thing for E0 plus E2. Okay? So E0 plus E2. And then I can use the first one again. And then again pick one more, pick one more, pick one more, I'll get 7 orthogonal parity checks for E0 plus E2. So at the end of the first step, I can maybe find E0 plus E1, E0 plus E2, E0 plus E3, E0 plus E4, so on. Okay, so you repeat for E0 plus E1 equals 2, 3, 4, 2, uh, let's say 7. Just, just 7. You can do more if you like, but 7 is enough. Okay, once you start at 7, then what do you do in the second step? Okay. In the second step, I have E0 plus E1, E0 plus E2, so on to E0 plus E7. You simply take majority again. Break. This will be not tie as such. Majority will be you know. Okay, so all these are caps. Okay. So that's how you do the decode. Okay. So, in general, if I go to Rm of R, comma M, okay, the general logic will uh, follow as such. Okay, so if you go to, so this is clear, right, in this example. So if, I, if you have any code, any regular code of reasonable size, you should be able to repeat the same process. Start with a suitable flat and then you keep on doing one more, one more, one more. So in general, what will this picture look like? If you want to decode Rm of R, comma M, the dual is what? Dual is Rm of m minus r minus one comma m, right? That's the dual. Okay. So what flats will this contain? R plus one flats and so on, right? So it will have r plus one flat. Okay. So what you do is in the first step you start with an r flat. Okay then find all the r plus 1 flats that pass through this r flat. That number will be exactly 2 power m minus r minus 1. By the same logic, so it's not very hard to do that computation. Okay? You will see the number of r plus 1 flats that pass through a fixed r flat or the contain a fixed r flat will be 2 power m minus r minus 1. And they will all be orthogonal on the particular r flat. Okay? So after the first step, you find R flats. So how many such R flats do you do? You take an R minus 1 flat and find how many ever all the R flats that are contained in uh, that contain that. Okay, so you repeat R minus 1, R minus 2, so on till you get to finally 1 and then what? Okay. So you take R plus 1 flats that contain this. So okay. And proceed so on. 
We are okay. So you do you do it for one particular R slot. You have to do it for a lot of R slots, right? So how do you pick all those R slots? You pick some other specific R minus one slot which is contained in this R slot. Okay, and you pick several R slots which all contain the R minus one slot. Okay, so after the second step, you would have found the R minus one slot. Now you would repeat the second step for several R minus two slots which are contained in the R minus one slot, so on and so on and so forth till you come back to the final step where you have lines and then you have the points. Okay, so that's the step. And in every step, you will have at least two two pi m minus R minus one. The limiting step will be the last first one. Okay, you have two pi m minus R minus one checks which are optional. You can do the computation. You know, this. Is that okay? So that is the majority logic decoding for an arbitrary read mode of code. And there are improvements to this. There are all kinds of refinements. Usually, people don't decode the read mode of code directly. They always puncture it and decode the punctured version. Why is that nice? Because that's cyclic. Once you find something for the first bit, the same thing shifted around will work for all the bits. And it's not only steps that you take. In every step, it will work. And the same thing works. Okay. So that is the nice, uh, nice thing about this. Okay. So we'll stop here for today. Hopefully this point was uh, reasonably uh, come across.